Okay, thank you. Is uh, the microphone adjusted reasonably so people can hear me? But uh, so either it is or no one can hear even hear my asking the question. I'll assume it's the former. Uh, okay, so this is the second of my uh, talks. The the first one had mostly pictures. This one is going to have mostly formulas, but they'll all be quite simple, general. There aren't going to be any uh, complicated formulas. They are going to be uh, quite general. And this, what I'm going to tell you today, I mean, is all based mainly on work that I did with my former student, Vivek Iyer, 15, uh, 25 uh, years ago. And that would probably be the best reference for the details of a few. I mean, there are a few calculations that do go in. and. That would be a good place for details. So let me just start. I mean, uh, I'm, Lagrangians and Hamiltonians are going to play the dominant role in what I'm going to be telling you about. I'm, the, the ultimate goal is going to be to derive the first law of black hole mechanics and thereby uh, derive a formula for black hole entropy. Uh, it's just as easy to do this in a completely general theory of gravity, uh, and I will be doing it in that context. Well, the completely general theory of gravity will be one that arises from a Lagrangian, as general relativity does with the Einstein-Hilbert uh, action. Uh, I just want to begin, though, with a, a you know, a statement that my views, I mean, changed, well, really quite radically beginning 30 years ago. Uh, I wrote my general relativity book 35 years ago or so, or finished it. Uh, the, and at that time, I mean, uh, you know, while I recognize that Lagrangians and Hamiltonians certainly play roles in quantization and so on. I didn't, I was not really aware that they, in classical field theory, that they were anything much more than a mnemonic device to memorize, to remember field equations. And I had already memorized Einstein's equation, so I didn't really think the Lagrangians were particularly important, uh, or Hamiltonians, important uh, uh, for anything, so I, you might notice uh, in my book that I stuck discussion. Uh, I do have a full discussion of the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian formulations of general relativity, but I stuck that in an appendix. Uh, you know, I now recognize that the existence of Lagrangians for a theory provides really important auxiliary structure to the classical field theory. So it is a really uh, important thing and, uh, you know, a lot of the, a, a lot of nice properties and ability to define, usefully define notions such as mass and so on, uh, as I will be very much talking about in this uh, lecture, uh, really stem back to Lagrangian and Hamiltonian uh, formulations, and in particular, the whole symmetries and conservation laws ideas critically uh, depend on that. So let me, the, the hard thing uh, to understand in this is, well, in, in what I'm going to be telling you, there's, there's not really any mathematics beyond advanced calculus in what I'll uh, be doing, but keeping a, a, a clear picture of what I'm doing and what the symbols mean and so on is important. So I'm actually, I'm going to wait. Uh, so I'm going to first kind of review particle mechanics, Lagrangian and Hamiltonian, in the kind of notation that I'm going to use. I'm going to explain a little more precisely what I mean by these variations of things that I'll be writing down all over the place. That's very simple and straightforward. But let me let me go through the particle mechanics example to kind of familiarize at least the physics people in here uh, with what I'm doing. Then I'll say a few words about the field theory case and what I'm uh, 
doing there, and then I'll do all the stuff that I'm intending to do in this, in this lecture. So uh, let's uh, imagine that we have, I mean, the setup in particle mechanics, uh, Lagrangian particle mechanics, is that we're given a Lagrangian that is some function. I'm just going to do one degree of freedom of position of the particle. And I'm just going to assume here of velocity, it could depend on higher time derivatives. In the theories I'm going to do, it could depend on any arbitrary number of derivatives of, as long as it's finite, uh, number of derivatives of the, the field variables. But this is the textbook uh, kind of case. And what one does then in mechanics textbooks is consider the variation of the Lagrangian. Now, the Lagrangian is a function of q and q dot. So if you vary, well, it's nicer to kind of think, think of, thing, of, the, of the description of the particle being a path in time, a world line. Uh, over all time, and if at uh, a given moment of time we vary the Lagrangian, it's, since it's a function of q and q dot, well, it's going to be dl dq delta q and dl dq dot delta q dot, but I can rewrite it in a way where I have a term that uh, only depends on the varied q and not its time derivative, or deriv no derivative of q, and a term that's a total time derivative. Now, usually this is done by sticking the Lagrangian under an integral, in this case with respect to time, calling it an action and varying that. And then the manipulations that put this in this form is, is an integration by parts, where you integrate by parts to take the, deriv the time derivative off of Q dot. I think it's enormously superior not to muck things up with integrals that probably don't converge anyway and talk about actions or whatever. Everything, certainly in the classical field theory, I think is just done much more simply and nicely by never introducing an action and just talking about the Lagrangian or the Lagrangian density that we'll talk about in the field theory case. So uh, setting the coefficient of delta q equals to 0 is, by definition, the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion. And one would say that your theory can be defined by uh, or can be obtained from a Lagrangian uh, if, in fact, the equations of motion of your theory are these Euler Lagrange equations that you get by setting this to zero. Now, in the usual derivation of the Euler-Lagrange equations, you also have this boundary term. You usually fix boundary conditions to make this term go away. In any case, this term is sort of totally discarded in most discussions and derivations because you're interested in the equations of motion. OK, I'm not the least bit interested in the equations of motion. Uh, in, I mean, I'm going to be interested that there are equations of motion of this form and that they're satisfied. But I, I already know the form of Einstein's equation. I don't care about what this is. I'm never going to look at this again. So effectively, I'm going to, in this entire talk, discard this term as being of no interest. What is of interest is this boundary term. Uh, that I'm calling theta. Unfortunately, there's a clash of notation with Piotr's lecture, who is using this uh, lowercase theta, fortunately, for another current. Uh, this term is a symplectic potential, uh, as you'll see. And uh, it's just what appears in, the, in this total derivative is what I'm calling uh, theta, and it's given by this formula. It's traditional in uh, a theory where you only have a first time derivative to call this partial derivative the momentum. So the theta in this case takes the form of p 
<coughs> excuse me, times the variation of Q. Uh, now we can obtain something uh, quite important and interesting by taking a second anti-symmetrized variation of Q. I'll, I'll explain what I mean by the second variation and so on. I, let me just get through this to, because this should look at least familiar to physics students. So uh, what I mean is I, I've done one variation which I'm calling, you know, the variation of Q to some in, infinitesimal variation to some delta one Q. Now I'm going to take, consider another variation. I, I think maybe I should just say what I really mean. I'm going to be, I mean, I have these paths that I'm perturbing off the path. I'm going to consider one parameter families, uh, well, for one variation, one parameter families. This, so lambda is just some parameter. And by delta Q, I just mean the partial derivative of this with respect to lambda. I mean, everything is going to be assumed to have smooth dependence on all uh, variables. When I take a, uh, when I consider a second variation, I'm going to be considering a two-parameter variation of the Q. So the delta 1 Q will be the derivative with respect to lambda 1. You can see this is not highly sophisticated. Uh, and the delta 2 Q will be the derivative with respect to lambda, lambda 2. So now what I'm, this theta that I have here depends on the background Q and this first variation, which is now a delta 1 Q. So I'm just going to take a partial derivative of that with respect to lambda 2 now. And then I'm going to anti-symmetrize over 1 and 2. So that's what's meant by this notation. I really, good idea to explain it now rather than uh, wait till later. So, that anti-symmetrized variation is what I've written here if you do the computation in this simple case. And this is an interesting quantity because this is a conserved quantity. It's independent of what time you do the evaluation on. Uh, that might not actually look totally obvious, but it uh, that is, provided the equations of motion are satisfied, or in particular, these perturbations satisfy the linear, linearized equations of motion about the original background path. But you know, this is the equations of motion. This is the theta term. If I take a second partial derivative of the Lagrangian here and set the equations of motion terms to zero, I'm only going to have this, this term. If I do the anti-symmetrization by a quality of mixed partial derivatives, I get 0 here. And then I'm just going to get the, so this time derivative of the anti-symmetrization of theta is 0. That's my conservation law. Now, conservation laws are great. And this is a very general conservation law. This by itself is not tremendously useful because it depends on two perturbations. And usually, you're dealing with one perturbation and look want a conservation law for that. As well, as we'll see tomorrow, you can get from this a very nice and very important conservation law from this. But that's a further story. That will be canonical energy that I'll talk about if the background is, uh, has a, a symmetry. OK. so. Uh, if, of course, if I'm looking at this as a kind of functional on the space of paths, this thing is incredibly degenerate because it only depends on what P and what delta P and delta Q are doing at time t naught. I mean, now I'm looking at it for it's conserved if these guys satisfy the equations of motion, but I can define this for any uh, perturbations. And, and any, you know, any paths whatsoever. 
but if I, f what this is degenerate on uh, is anything, any path variations that have no delta, one, delta P or delta Q at time T naught. There are plenty of paths, not ones that satisfy the equations of motion that, that do that. But if I factor out by all of the things that this omega is degenerate on, that defines a notion of phase space. So the phase space can be identified with the P's and Q's at a moment, at one moment of time. So that's a finite dimensional space. The, the space of paths is some horribly infinite dimensional space. And now once I've used the Lagrangian and this symplectic structure that you get to define phase space, we can define the notion of a Hamiltonian. A uh, Hamiltonian is a function on phase space. Uh, well, it, we might as well pull it back, though, to the space of paths, uh, uh, whose variation in this sense is given by the symplectic product, well, yeah, I realize this needs as much explanation as the field theory uh, kind of explanation. So again, I'm considering this one parameter family of paths. And of course, my, my at lambda equals 0, that's some unperturbed path that I'm considering. Uh, a function h on phase space will be said to be a Hamiltonian if under this one parameter variation, the variation of h with the lambda is this omega that I've uh, previously defined where I stick in this arbitrary path variation in one of the slots. In the other slot, I tick, stick in the time derivative, uh, the time derivative of Q. Uh, so another way of writing this would be to say that if I kind of get rid of the arbitrary tangent vector in here and look at this as a, uh, well, inverse uh, 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 as a symplectic form uh, on the manifold. I mean, this, this is really saying that the gradient of h, I mean, I'm kind of dotting it into this tangent vector here. Uh, the gradient of h is the, let me put in indices, is the symplectic, uh, well, I've gotten rid of an entry in this slot. I mean, in this formula, I've stuck it in. Uh, you know, times the, well, you might call this the, uh, well, the Hamiltonian vector field, the object that's giving you the flow on phase space. This is, phase, I mean, I've kind of written this in path space, so this is including when you bring it back to phase space, the, the momentum motion uh, as well as that. So this is the vector field on phase space that's uh, telling you how things flow under uh, dynamical evolution. So this is possibly a more familiar to people who've had, you know, Hamiltonian mechanics from Arnold or something. Uh, a, a more familiar form of Hamilton's equations of motion to get the much more familiar form of Hamilton's equation of motion. We just take the, apply the inverse symplectic uh, form to both sides of this equation and solve for the Hamiltonian vector field, which is telling us how P and Q evolve, and those are given in terms of partial derivatives of h. So that's the usual form of Hamilton's equations of motion. Now, if you're given a Hamiltonian and trying to figure out how the particle moves, uh, 
Uh, this is a much more useful form of Hamilton's equations of motion. But in the game that I'll be playing for the rest of the, this lecture, I mean, we, uh, I, I don't care about the equations of motion. I already know them in better forms elsewhere anyway. Uh, but I can figure out what this symplectic product is from the Lagrangian, and what I really want to solve for or try to figure out what it is is the Hamiltonian. Uh, so this is a nicer way of writing the equation, but these are, if you solve for the Q dot in this equation, uh, that's, you'll just get the ordinary form of Hamilton's equations of motion. So, Actually, let me write the, this, some of this stuff now down in the field theory case, and then let me pause to see if people are happy or unhappy with what I'm saying, uh, uh, because if everything is really simple, if, if, but it, if you're with me on what I'm doing and writing down, uh, but uh, it can get very confusing if, uh, if I've, uh, you know, not clarified what I'm doing. So I want to uh, write down analog expressions to what I just wrote down now in the case where we have some fields on space-time. So I think it would actually be a really good idea for me to draw on one board here, some fixed manifold M. The topology is completely irrelevant because all the calculations are going to be local calculations, so pick whatever space-time manifold you'd like uh, to work with. And then I'm going to denote by just this single letter phi all of the dynamical fields that I'm interested in considering. Now, I'm definitely going to be interested in theories of gravity, so I'm going to be, I'm going to always have in what I do later, it doesn't need to be now, uh, I'm going to have a space-time metric, uh, and then I might have various matter fields, uh, uh, and so on. But, so, here I'm drawing the space-time manifold, and these are all tensor fields uh, here on the space-time manifold. Okay. It is useful to keep distinct from that something that I will be alluding to, but only for heuristic purposes, uh, some really big space of all field configurations. So a given, if we have a particular field, this is space-time, I'm not doing any three plus one, anything like that here. Uh, if I give you a metric and all the matter fields everywhere on space-time, you know, this will correspond, you know, to a single point uh, in what I'm thinking of the field configuration space. Again, I'm only going to use this for heuristic type purposes, but it's nice to think of it this way. So I'm not introducing any topology on this or any, uh, you know, Banach space structure or anything, anything like that. Uh, I don't need to. It's not going to come up particularly or be relevant to anything. I will. The only thing that I will do where conditions on these fields will be relevant is I will occasionally, as you see, take integrals, and then I'll need these fields to be such that these integrals converge, and, well, there'll be some boundary terms arising in those integrals, and I'll need asymptotic conditions to make sure those, those uh, are satisfied, but that's all uh, that I'll be, that I'll be uh, using. Okay, so... Let's see what I, you should have already mastered this slide, so I should, while well, I was talking over here, so I may not. Okay, so I, I'm interested in Lagrangians, 
One, I'm not going to put them under integral signs, I've already said. That's one difference that you'll see. But an, another difference, well, Piotr uh, introduced Lagrangians in the talk yesterday, and he introduced them as densities and had, you know, square root of g's and so on in the Einstein-Hilbert or any other gravitational uh, Lagrangian. It is tremendously convenient, uh, at least from my perspective, not to work with densities, but to take the Lagrangian that's going to be defined here on the space-time uh, to be, I'm just writing it down with indices, though I'm not actually going to use indices. There I will use bold-faced letters to denote forms but to take the Lagrangian to be an end form. So this is something ready, this is the M I'm taking to be n dimensional because again, there's no, dimension doesn't play any role in, and topology doesn't play any, any role, dimension doesn't play any role, and the form of the field equations do not play any role in anything that I'm gonna be saying, so there's no reason to make uh, such restrictions, but you're also welcome to set n equals 4, if you like, uh, uh, et cetera, and you won't lose much uh, making that, uh, that dis distinction. So I'm going to assume that we are given this n form that is a local function, so at any point here in the manifold, I'm not in field space here, I'm here on the space-time manifold, this is a function of phi. This grad is some arbitrary derivative operator. I mean, we'll, uh, but we're only allowed, that's a different n, uh, that's a k, let's say, finitely many derivatives, but you can have as many uh, as you like. Okay, and the same, standard classical mechanics uh, trick that one can do is if you take a variation of L and, you know, now all I mean by this delta symbol uh, is that this phi, well, the phi, of course, is a function on space-time or tensor fields on space-time, but I'm going to consider one parameter families or when I take second variations, I'll be considering two parameter families of it, and the, the delta phi uh, is, again, just the partial derivative with respect to lambda. Now, the delta phi and you know, something like the Lagrangian that's a function of phi, of course, I can take its variation is just also the partial derivative with respect to lambda when I go along this one parameter sequence of phi's. The delta phi is kind of nicely, so this is phi thought of as a field on all of space time. The delta phi is kind of nicely thought of as a tangent vector in this field space. Uh, but again, that's, this is all just, you know, for help in thinking. Okay, if I take the variation of L in precisely the sense that I'm taking, that is, stick in this into L and take the partial derivative with respect to lambda, again, well, if I write it this way, it doesn't really look that obvious that you can do it. But if you put it under an integral sign, uh, you would immediately be led to do integration by parts manipulations uh, that would put the variation of L into a form where there is something that depends only on the background times varied phi's with no derivatives of phi whatsoever. Okay, and then, well, if we were doing this with a Lagrangian density, uh, the way Piot was, uh, we'd end up with a total divergence. 
Well, again, my theta is not his theta, but this is what Piot was writing down. Uh, the corresponding formula, if we have, if we're taking L to be a form instead of a total divergence, it's just an exact form. So this is some n minus 1 form on space-time, and this is locally constructed from phi and delta phi, and you can write out, you can work, you can kind of do all the integration by parts manipulations and work out what it is. So E equals 0 are the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion, and I'm not interested in them. I'm going to throw them away. But the boundary term uh, I am interested in, and in the same way as I've explained, we can take a second anti-symmetrized variation of this theta. So now on space-time, the theta over here, this theta is an n minus 1 form. So the omega is also, which is just obtained by taking partial derivatives with respect to lambda, uh, you know, lambda 2 or whatever, uh, uh, that's also an n minus 1 form on, on space-time. OK, and now, uh, well, this is all that I had to do in the particle case, where this was a space was uh, you know, effectively zero dimensional. We were only worrying about things varying in time. Uh, and this was a zero form thereby or whatever. Uh, now with this being an n minus one form, uh, if we're going to get a number out of it, we have to integrate over a surface. And what I'm going to do is uh, consider this object as this well, symplectic current or symplectic n minus 1 form integrated over a Cauchy surface. Um, so here, of course, if the Cauchy surface is non-compact, I would have to assume some asymptotic conditions on the fields that would guarantee that this integral would converge if I want to, if I want to work with this. So I'm going to implicitly assume that. Uh, but this is, well, the, the corresponding conservation law is that this form is automatically closed. Uh, and if we have two Cauchy surfaces, then if there is no flux through the boundary, Stokes' theorem will tell you that the omega is conserved between here and here. Of course, there might depending on the boundary conditions or asymptotic conditions, there might be uh, flux through the boundary. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm going to more or less implicitly assume that there's not. And when we get to asymptotically flat space times and things like that, we'll be imposing boundary conditions so that there isn't any such flux, and this will be conserved. OK, and now. Given this, we can again define the phase space of the theory by factoring out all the degeneracies of this omega that is defined by just considering this one Cauchy surface. So we get basically get rid of all the you know field behavior off finitely off the Cauchy surface is irrelevant and only uh, is completely irrelevant and only some finite number of derivatives, time derivatives, normal derivatives of the fields are going to play a role in the omega because the original Lagrangian only depended on finitely many derivatives. Uh, so whatever the omega depends on, or this omega really depends on, is going to effectively define the phase space. I actually don't know how to define canonical coordinates in any natural way. If, if we have a theory that only depends on one time derivative, then there's a similar obvious way of doing that. There isn't, as far as I'm aware, any obvious way of doing that quite generally, but I don't care. Uh, that's not 
relevant to anything that still allows me to define the phase space. Uh, and then I can define a notion of a Hamiltonian, but exactly the same way as I did. But now, I mean, in the particle case, you know, the only dynamical kind of direction was time. I mean, you know, we were kind of considering a zero dimensional system with, well, in our case, one degree of freedom or could be finitely many degrees of freedom. Uh, but now over here in the space time manifold, I can consider the evolution along any vector field of my choice. I'll call that vector field C. And then I will say that, well, that's a vector field in the space-time manifold. I'm really, uh, well, that induces that motion in, uh, when you move the fields along this vector field, that, of course, induces a motion of the fields in phase space. Uh, and I'm interested in whether there is a Hamiltonian describing that motion. But I have a different notion of time evolution for every possible choice of vector field. So the, there's an important subscript C here uh, on the Hamiltonian, because there isn't such a thing as the Hamiltonian. It's the Hamiltonian conjugate to a notion of time translation. And time translation can be chosen to be any vector field whatsoever. Uh, there's no reason the vector field has to be time-like, for example. I mean, in order to ask whether there is a Hamiltonian conjugate to that. So notice, I'm not saying that there is a Hamiltonian. That's going to be a major question. I'm saying. If you can find an, an object uh, that satisfies this equation whenever the phi satisfies the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion that you get from the Lagrangian, then I will call this object a Hamiltonian. OK, so let me stop there and yeah. Yeah. It's uh, the Cauchy surfaces I were drawing here are surfaces in space time. So they belong um, in the same diagram where I had all these other things. Good. They, these are, that's exactly the kind of question that, yeah. Yes. The, in, in the Lagrangian here, this is just some arbitrary derivative operator. Well, there would be if I have to use, I'm, I'm about to get to diffeomorphism covariant theories. So, You'll be happier uh, on this point is when I get to the next slide. But for what I'm writing down here and for all the formulas on these pages, uh, on the slides I've shown so far, the, the nabla is some arbitrary fixed non-dynamical derivative operator. I mean, I can't take it to be well, it would be confusing to take that dynamical uh, because I, I want to represent the dynamical fields by tensor fields. I could represent it as a dynamical field by taking the difference between the derivative operator and some fixed derivative operator, but that wouldn't, that wouldn't help your question. I, so it's much, I want to just introduce a fixed derivative operator and uh, I mean, people normally would do that because they're working in coordinates and they'd write down partial derivatives and uh, 
the coordinates. So that's a choice of fixed derivative operator. The Lagrangian, I'm sorry. No, no, you can uniquely, the, the E is unique. The theta is not unique. You could add an exact form to theta, but the E is unique. Yeah. There will be a change in theta. I will get to what you, you know, what you can fiddle around with and what you can change by making changes of that sort. That's relevant because we'd like to know whether things are unique or have arbitrariness in them, and that, that's very relevant to everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that I'm really being formal on. I, I mean, yeah. there I'm, uh, I mean, uh, that. Yeah. So the, the factorization uh, I'm doing over here, so I am kind of cheating. But the omega now is an object over here, because I've done the integral. It, only depends on, I mean, of course, I have an arbitrary choice of Cauchy surface that came into the definition, but the omega quantity I can think of as a quantity over here now. Yeah, right. So it would more properly be thought of as a two form. So it's an, the, the little omega is an, this is, can be very confusing. The little omega is an n minus one form on actual space time. The capital omega would be most naturally thought of as a two form, because it's anti-symmetric and it depends on a pair of tangent vectors on this field space. But then it's highly degenerate on this field space and so you, you know, can do the factorization to get to a phase space. No, the omega is over here is a tensor field, so it, there's no. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the degeneracy subspaces have to be integrable, if that's possibly what you're worried about. And formally, they are integrable. Now, you know, if I really wanted, I mean, again, you could just explicitly write down what the phase space is without having to try to really work with the infinite dimensional manifolds that I haven't even given a topology to or anything like that and kind of really do the factorization in the, but the, the yeah, yeah, but I think what's bothering you is completely legitimate that the, 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 the subspaces that you get of degeneracies have to in fact be integrable and then you can really factor and talk about, but again, formally they are integrable and if you don't want to do that, you could really just explicitly, I mean, for general relativity, I can tell you explicitly what the phase space is, and it will correspond to this. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so in fact, I will be sort of doing everything working in a little neighborhood of one point. So I'm going to choose, I mean, everything is going to be very local in every sense. I mean, the calculations are all local in space-time, but uh, 
they're all local in field space too. So I'm going to choose something when I'm perturbing about a space-time. I will choose something that's a Cauchy surface of the background space-time. Uh, th th these are very good questions. I, I mean, okay. Yes. No, I'm, I'm, I have no idea if the equations are well posed or not, and it doesn't enter anything. I'm not saying that, that there's a, you know, I'm defining a phase space and I'm defining the structure. I'm not saying anything about existence and uniqueness of solutions to the equations of motion. Okay, I'm just telling you here's the initial data, but I'm not telling you that if you give me the initial data, I can find a solution or it's unique or anything like that. I mean, it would be reasonable to call the phase space the initial data space, but I, I'm not saying anything about well-posedness. Okay, well, I think the rest of this will now be easy. Uh, so now uh, on to the theories that I'm interested in, which are diffeomorphism covariant theories, which where the Lagrangian is entirely constructed from dynamical fields. There's no background structure. Now, I may have needed a, some extraneous derivative operator, as we were saying, to write down the Lagrangian, but I want to, to uh, if I do a diffio of all the dynamical fields, I want the Lagrangian to change by a diffio. And that actually implies that the Lagrangian can be rewritten, no matter how I first wrote it with a background derivative operator, it can always be rewritten in the form I've written here, this is essentially the Thomas replacement theorem of the, goes back to the 1930s, I think. Uh, so I can get rid of the background derivative operator and rewrite the Lagrangian as a function of the metric, the Riemann curvature, symmetrized derivatives of the Riemann curvature. Oh, these are the, now the derivative operators associated with the metric. So now there's no, explicitly no background structure. Uh, and then the matter fields and their symmetrized derivatives. So that's the form the Lagrangian of any diffeomorphism covariant theory has. And the diffeomorphism covariant theories are very nice because they automatically acquire another current, which is exactly what Piotr was uh, talking about yesterday. So I'm using J for, rather than theta for the another current. It's associated with some choice of vector field. And the definition of it is it's just the symplectic potential, the thing that you got, the boundary term that most people th throw away foolishly, because uh, that's the important thing from the Lagrangian uh, uh, in the varied Lagrangian. But the, the theta depends on a perturbation, a variation of phi, and you stick in depends linearly on that, and you stick in the Lie derivative of phi with respect to this vector field in that slot, and then you subtract off C time dotted into the Lagrangian. This corresponds exactly to Piotr's formula. If you take the D of this n minus 1 form, uh, well, yeah, let me, I better not take the time to go through each derivation, even though there is no derivation that's more than a line or two. But d theta uh, is given by this formula that has an equation of motion in it. And anyway, if you use appropriate this term, when you take the d of that, uh, uh, anyway, you can, you can manipulate the formula that I uh, gave you, the, the delta there is, in that formula, is the Lie derivative, 
So anyway, you get this uh, formula which tells you that the J is closed, and it's closed for an arbitrary vector field if the equations of motion are satisfied. There is a much stronger result, though. The, this is a very standard result. There's a much stronger result that says that uh, uh, even if you don't satisfy the equations, well, OK, let me. The fact that, the, that this J is closed for all T, when, let's consider the case where the equations of motion are satisfied. So we're off of phi that satisfies the equations of motion. The fact that this object is closed for all C, in fact, implies that it's exact. There's no topology involved in there. It's just a straightforward calculation that you cannot have something that's constructed out of C and finitely many of its derivatives that's closed for all possible values of C. Well, this is if it's linear in C as it is. Uh, it can't be closed unless it's exact. So that's a separate argument, and it's you know not a totally trivial computation, but it's just a computation. So in fact, the stronger result is that even when the equations of motion are not satisfied, uh, the J can always be written in the form of C with no derivatives times something that vanishes when the equations of motion hold plus an exact form. These C's that come in here into this formula are naturally called, for reasons I won't take the time to get into, the constraints of the theory. Again, this has nothing to do with well-posed initial value formulation, but, the, but uh, uh, you know, one could still legitimately call these objects the constraints. For general relativity, which I will do in a minute, uh, these are precisely the usual constraints. I mean, if you choose a, a hypersurface, the normal, uh, if you choose C normal to that, that's called the Hamiltonian constraint. If you choose the C tangential, these are, those are the momentum constraints. Uh, and this object is going to play a big role in what I'm going to do, uh, that you obtain from this another current, and that's what we called the another charge. So, uh, so the another charge is an n minus two form, and it's locally constructed out of the dynamical fields and the vector field C, and of, and of course only finitely many of its derivatives. It actually can have more derivatives than you had in the original Lagrangian because you integrate by parts and get pick up more and things like that, but, but uh, it's still only finitely many. And in fact, you can just chase through the whole procedures that I've given in general here and find that uh, this another charge, in fact, always takes this form. It can have a term that depends on C with no derivatives. It can have a term that depends on anti-symmetrized derivatives of C. It can have a term that depends on the Lie derivative uh, of with respect to C of the dynamical fields, and it can, it can of course have an exact form because that you can trivially see. However, as was raised in a question, you uh, have freedom to redefine things. In particular, as was already mentioned, you could have added an exact form to the Lagrangian. You could also have added an exact form to theta, uh, and you can certainly add an exact form to to Q, and when you take that into account, uh, you can use that freedom, I mean, in particular, the, th the freedom you have in defining the theta can be used to just get rid of this term, uh, et cetera. You, you can uh, show that, in fact, without loss of generality, you can assume that the, by making, by these redefinitions, you can assume that Q takes this form, 
And indeed, you can com compute, once you've reduced it to this form, what this coefficient x is. And strangely enough, there's a simple, the formula isn't all that simple, because the Euler-Lagrange equations for a general Lagrangian are not all that simple. But rather remarkably, and I don't have any understanding of why this is true, uh, if you took the Lagrangian written in this form, which you can do, and you pretended that the Riemann curvature tensor was an independent dynamical field having nothing to do with the metric, you could then compute the equations of motion for the Riemann tensor. Okay. Those equations of motion is what comprise, I mean, of course, they're not equations of motion and they're not satisfied, but that formula for the equations of motion for the Riemann tensor is what this x uh, is made up of. So that's an explicit formula for what x is. OK. So now, what about Hamiltonians? Is there a Hamiltonian for some arbitrary vector field? Well, here I have written out the full derivation uh, of everything. Remember that a Hamiltonian is, we're supposed to, we define this sort of symplectic product this way and we're looking for something whose variation is related to the symplectic product in this kind of way. So can we find such an H? Well, I'm going to write down a, a formula for the variation of the another current. So one of the, this part comes uh, just directly from the definition of another current here. I'll just vary that. Whoops. Uh, but now I'll use the formula for the variation of the Lagrangian. Uh, and remarkably, that gives me theta terms that come in as a second anti-symmetrized variation. One of the variations is the one that I'm considering here. The other variation is do an infinitesimal gauge transformation associated with C. But this is the anti-symmetrized variation. So we get a formula then that says that the symplectic product of an arbitrary variation with a gauge variation is the varied another current plus this boundary term. OK, but we also have this formula for the another current. So we can substitute that in here and see that the symplectic product of a variation and lead C phi uh, so um, I think I didn't say this explicitly, but phi is a solution to the equations of motion here. The delta phi is any variation. So that's exactly what we need to be delta h, uh, whatever. That, uh, we get this formula for the symplectic product. So now if we can write this thing Sorry for jumping around. If we can write this, this is exactly what we have computed. If we can write this as the variation of something, then that something is a Hamiltonian. So we've figured out, well, essentially the necessary and co sufficient conditions. So can we write this as the variation of something? Well, yeah, this term, yes, we just pull out the delta. It's the variation of the constraints. So if there's a Hamiltonian, there'll be a volume integral that's of pure constraint form. Uh, here, we can also pull out the constraints. So there'll be a boundary term uh, uh, that, because uh, we're integrating this exact form, and I'm using Stokes' theorem, and I'm not assuming that things go to, everything goes to zero asymptotically. Uh, so I can pull out the delta here. So the whole question is, can I pull out the delta here? Uh, 
if I can, there's a Hamiltonian and we have the formula, and if not, then not. Well, this thing you can't, in general, pull out the delta from because then this would have been an exact form over here on field space, and the symplectic product would have been zero. Uh, but asymptotically, which is all that we care about for this, the omega can go to zero, and with asymptotic flatness boundary conditions at spatial infinity, it will go to zero, and you can pull this out. So for asymptotically flat space times, or for many much more general classes of space times, I mean, asymptotically anti de Sitter will work, uh, lots of other cases you know, may work, uh, you can find an object so that when you just look at this asymptotically, the variation of this boundary term does give you the theta. And in that case, you have a Hamiltonian for the theory. It's pure constraint plus a surface term. So if you, this is now an arbitrary diffeomorphism covariant theory, by the way, right? Not just general relativity. And so if the equations of motion that I'm calling the constraints are satisfied, so on shell, as the particle physicists say, then in any diffeomorphism covariant theory, if you have a Hamiltonian, it will be purely a surface term. Of course, if you're doing a compact Cauchy surface where you don't have a boundary, then the Hamiltonian is going to be this pure constraint and will vanish, although I will allow Pyotr to make it five because this equation This equation allows you to add a field-independent constant to the Hamiltonian. You're only getting the variation of it. So it, has, it can be five, but it has to be five for every solution. But uh, I, I'm sticking with zero in the compact case. But you have this surface term. So if we use time translations, uh, for our vector field, so what would that mean in the asymptotically flat space time? If I take some vector field that is, as we have an asymptotic notion of a time translation, if I take it, uh, uh, if I use that notion, the value of the Hamiltonian is naturally what one would call the energy, or in gravitational theories, the mass. Uh, if you choose the asymptote, if you choose the vector field for which you're trying to get a Hamiltonian to asymptotically be a rotation, uh, uh, then the corresponding Hamiltonian, well, there's a minus sign conventionally in that, I mean, having to do with the signature of the metric and time-like versus space-like directions. Uh, that would naturally be called the angular momentum, and this would be the formula for the angular momentum. Now, one nice thing happens with angular momentum, in fact, because uh, the phi, you could choose your asymptotic boundary so that phi is tangent to the boundary, in which case this boundary contribution automatically vanishes. So, uh, Completely generally, then, in that case, you have a formula for angular momentum. Uh, you always have a Hamiltonian, and you have a formula for angular momentum that's just the another charge. But that's not true for the Hamiltonian. So let's look at this in general relativity, which I think will definitely help make this more concrete, and also this sheds a lot of light on the ADM formula for mass and angular momentum versus the so-called Komar form, well, not so-called, the Komar formula for. So the Lagrangian in, in general relativity is just the scalar curvature, but I'm taking the Lagrangian to be an N, a four form in four dimensions, so it's the space-time volume element times the scalar curvature is the differential forms version of the Lagrangian. It's not hard to compute the symplectic potential, you know, do the 
going back a bit far, but you can compute what the th boundary term theta is when you do the variation of this uh, Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian. And that's what you get for theta. If you take a second anti-symmetrized variation of this to get the symplectic current, it, you know, the expression, depending on how compactly the notation you use is, you know, would take at least half of this slide to write out, but it's completely straightforward to do that. Go through the calculations of the another current and the another charge, the another current, uh, is what I've written here, and uh, it's not hard to see that it's conserved and not all that interesting in its own right. Uh, the another charge is given by this formula, which people familiar with the Komar formula uh, would recognize. I mean, this is, of course, for an arbitrary vector field here, but this would be recognized as the integrand in the Komar formula for angular momentum. And indeed, uh, if you look at an asymptotic rotation, the Hamiltonian formula for angular momentum is just this. If phi happens to be a killing field, this is, of course, the Komar formula for angular momentum. But it's also the ADM formula for angular momentum. I mean, ADM would write that out in, you know, slightly different ways with the canonical momentum of the metric and so on in the formulas, but this is a equivalent to the ADM expression. Okay, if we go now to the time translation case, uh, then indeed we can find this appropriate boundary term and the boundary contribution, you know, this B term that uh, comes in, you know, to the theta, you know, that reproduces the theta when we take a variation near infinity. So the T dot B comes out to be this. Uh, the Hamiltonian then, again, if we're on shell, is purely the this, this surface term, and in fact, these boundary terms here with the GTT and so on exactly cancel similar terms that arise in the Komar-like formula, and what you end up is the, with the formula for ADM mass. Uh, now, if T was a killing field, and you take the Komar formula but fudge the factor to be a 1 over 8 pi instead of the correct 1 over 16 pi that would appear from the another charge, uh, then, in fact, in the stationary case, uh, you'll get agreement with the ADM mass. But if you try to do this in the non-stationary case, you'll get complete nonsense. I mean, you'll, you're, you're answer will depend on your choice of vector field that represents asymptotic time translation symmetry. OK, so now what does this have to do with black hole thermodynamics and so on? Well, we've got all the machinery now set up to derive the first law of black hole mechanics, not just in general relativity, but in an arbitrary diffeomorphism covariant theory of gravity. So let's go back. I was doing general relativity as an example, but let's go back to a general diffeomorphism covariant theory of gravity. Uh, and if I integrate, uh, well, we have somewhere here got to be after this because this is, yeah, we've got, well, actually, I don't, okay, I, here, we have this formula for omega, sorry, uh, so this is the formula for the symplectic product of an arbitrary, off of some, 
background solution uh, for uh, the symplectic product of an arbitrary perturbation with a gauge perturbation. I mean, Li C of dynamical fields is just how the dynamical fields change under an infinitesimal diffeo, so I'm totally justified in calling that a gauge transformation. So now let me consider the situation that we left off with at the end of last lecture, where we have a stationary black hole, but I can idealize the final state of the black hole as having a bifurcate killing horizon. So off here is infinity. Here's the actual event horizon of the black hole. But I'm going to take the, you know, the idealized final equilibrium state of the black hole. And I'm going to take a Cauchy surface for the exterior. So that will start at the bifurcation surface and then go off to infinity. And I assume it's going to be asymptotically flat near infinity. So let me take the identity, the general identity. Again, I probably shouldn't be paging back and forth uh, this much. But you know, there's a general identity that comes from this with the j substituted in there. I'm going to take that identity and integrate that over this Cauchy surface for a stationary black hole. And I'm going to get a correct formula. We'll see if that formula is interesting or not. I wouldn't be spending all this time on all these other things if the formula wasn't interesting. So yeah, so let me, uh, of course, assume that, uh, uh, let me take the C that appears in these formulas to be the horizon killing field, the one guaranteed by the Hawking rigidity theorem. That has the property that it, that killing field automatically vanishes on the bifurcation surface. That killing field, as I discussed at the end of the last lecture, is a linear combination of a time translation and a rotation with a constant here in front that's usually called the angular velocity of the horizon. Now, my, uh, my black hole is stationary. So the, and invariant in particular under the horizon killing field. So in this formula, the Lee C of phi is 0 because my background solution is invariant. My perturbation is an arbitrary perturbation. I'm not assuming anything like about that. But I am going to assume that my, background, my perturbation satisfies the linearized Einstein equation, and in particular, the linearized constraint equation. So in this formula, this vanishes because that's 0. This vanishes because that's 0. And all I get are boundary terms are equal to 0. But now I'm going to get boundary terms from infinity and boundary terms from the horizon. Well, the boundary terms from infinity, we, were just, we just got through evaluating. That's, those are just the, well, you know, that's just that. Well, these are not varied Hamiltonians, but where do I have a varied Hamiltonian? OK, anyway, the boundary terms from infinity are just going to be, you know, for t is just going to be the varied ADM mass, and for phi is just going to be the varied ADM angular momentum. So the boundary term, the sum of the boundary term from infinity and the boundary term from the bifurcation surface, which on these slides I'm labeling as sigma, vanishes. The, the 
these are just give you the varied ADM energy and angular momentum from the, the horizon, well, you get, this is a relatively nasty term, but C, the theta is, but the C vanishes on the bifurcation surface. So you just get the varied another charge. So that's what this general formula reduces to in this uh, particular case. Now, if you go back, I'm not sure I should go back, but if you go back to the formula for the another charge and vary it as it's supposed to appear there, it follows, since the derivative of the killing field comes in, that's related to the surface gravity, you end up finding that the varied another charge is just the surface gravity of the horizon times the variation of a quantity that I've written here as S, where S is just this X quantity, which was just the Riemann kind of equations of motion. Now for general relativity, the action is just metrics times R, so when you vary that with respect to R, you just get metrics and you just end up with an area element here and the S is just one quarter the area when you work through the numerical factors. For an arbitrary theory of gravity, there'll be more complicated terms with the Riemann tensor in it and so on. But that is, uh, whoops, that is what you end up with in an arbitrary diffeomorphism covariant theory of gravity. So let me quickly end now with, uh, uh, since I'm already a minute over, I just realized looking at the clock, but going back to the subject of black holes and thermodynamics, whoops, uh, you know, a body in thermal equilibrium uh, is somewhat analogous to a stationary black hole. Bodies in thermal equilibrium are characterized by a small number of state parameters. Stationary black holes are similarly characterized by the very non-trivial black hole uniqueness theorems by a small number of parameters. We already saw that the surface gravity of a black hole is constant over the event horizon of a stationary black hole, analogous to the constancy of the temperature. I've now shown, well, I've generalized this to allow char Maxwell fields and so on, but that's fairly straightforward, uh, that the variations in mass, angular momentum, and charge are related to the variation in area by an complete analog of the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, and we've already seen yesterday that the area theorem is an analog of the second law of thermodynamics. And it goes beyond that because the analogous quantities in these formulas, uh, well, in particular mass and energy, are in fact the same physical quantities. Uh, we're going to have to wait till my last lecture, though, to worry about whether surface gravity and temperature are physically the same quantity. And uh, uh, then we can talk about whether area really represents entropy. But I've already gone three minutes over, so I had better stop here. Thank you.